repeal and amendment bill introduced in Lok Sabha. The aim is to abolish the old obsolete laws. Mine, land acquisition and telegraph wires law will end. Three sites of India included in the tentative list of UNESCO. The number of such sites crossed 50. Una Koti painting may get international recognition. ONDC will be implemented on the lines of UPI. The objective is to provide a level playing field to e-commerce operators could be launched in 2023. Genome sequencing of Banyan ant people 17 out of 19 genes of people are effective in stress tolerance. Researchers of IISER Bhopal carried out the research. And last week was special for Kerala in terms of agricultural products. Five agricultural products got GI tag. Watermelon got this title for the first time. Recently, the government introduced the Repealing and Amending Bill 2022 in the Lok Sabha. Its purpose is to eliminate obsolete laws. Along with this, the mistakes in the laws have to be rectified by changing some words. It is being said that the laws that this bill will abolish are about 60 years old. A law in this is also 137 years old. It has been proposed to repeal the Land Acquisition Mines Act of 1885. It also proposes to repeal the Telegraph Wires Unlawful Possession Act of 1950. In fact, under the Telegraph Wires Act, if a person is found to have telegraph wire in any quantity or is proven to be in possession of it, then there is a provision for punishment. However, if he proves that he had obtained the wires lawfully, he will be acquitted under the law. Through this bill, it has also been proposed to repeal some of the appropriation bills passed in recent years. In fact, such laws become meaningless over time. And even if any attempt is made to make them relevant by amending them in a way, it is like writing the whole law in a new way. Along with this, some laws are made to solve an immediate problem which becomes irrelevant after a period of time. In such a situation, keeping these laws is an unnecessary exercise. Recently, three cultural sites of India were included in the tentative list of UNESCO World Heritage Site. These include the Sun Temple of Modhira, the city of Vardnagar in Gujarat and the idols of Una Koti in Tripura. This information has been given by the Archaeological Survey of India. After this, the number of sites included in the tentative list of UNESCO World Heritage Sites in India has increased to 52. Significantly, Modhira is a village located in the Mehsana district of Gujarat. It is mainly known for the Sun Temple. The Sun Temple of Modhira was built by Bhimdev I, the ruler of the Solanki dynasty, during 1026 and 27 AD. In fact, Surya, that is, Sun was considered as the family deity of the Solanki dynasty. For this reason, he built the Modhira Sun Temple for sun worship. This temple is situated on a hill. Its speciality is that the rays of the sun falling on the temple from sunrise to sunset. The Sanctum Sanctorum of the temple has beautiful carvings on its walls, representing mythological stories. Apart from this, 12 statues have been engraved on the pillars located in the temple, which represent the sun according to the 12 months. Similarly, Vadnagar is a city located in the Mahisana district of Gujarat. It is mentioned in the Puranas and is in the travelogues of Chinese traveller Huan Xiang as a prosperous city. The Gujarat State Archaeological Department started excavations of Vadnagar in 2006. After this, in the year 2014, the works of excavation was given to ASI. After this, with the joint efforts of both institutions, about 20,000 artifacts, including Buddhist relics, were discovered from here. The time period of some of these is to be around the 2nd century AD. Una Koti is a site located in Agartala, the capital of Tripura, which is highly popular for its rock artifacts and rock cut sculptures. These idols include images of many gods and goddesses, including Lord Shankar. In the local language, Unakoti means less than one crore. According to local legends, a craftsman was insisting on going to Kalash with Lord Shankar. Shiva Parvati put a condition on this that if he builds one crore idols in one night, 
then he will be able to go to Kailash. The craftsman made the idols the whole night, but when the count was done in the morning, one idol remained short. That is why the place was named Unakoti. Recently, the 15th edition of the Convention on Biodiversity was organized. The last day of the conference was historic in terms of biodiversity conservation efforts as the Kunming Montreal Agreement was finalized on this day. Its purpose is to protect land and oceans along with organisms and their species from the threat of pollution, erosion and climate change. This agreement has received the support of about 200 countries, including India. Experts have compared it to the Paris Agreement of the UNFCCC. The agreement has been agreed to after four years of negotiations. In the agreement, a final package has been agreed upon. For the conservation of biodiversity, it envisages raising the level of financial resources from all the sources to at least 200 billion US dollars per year by 2030. Apart from this, there is also talks of increasing the annual financial assistance for poor countries to at least $20 billion by 2025. However, by the year 2030, there is a provision to increase it to $30 billion per year. Apart from this, it has been agreed to cut down on agricultural subsidies given by various countries. Also, by the year 2030, a commitment has been made for the protection of about one-third of the earth. It includes land, river, coastal areas and sea areas. So far, about 17% of the land and 10% of the marine areas are protected. In fact, excessive exploitation of resources and climate change affects global biodiversity. In such a situation, it is important to protect the species of animals and plants around the world from these threats. Recently, the Living Planet Report 2022 of World Wildlife Fund has also presented a worrying picture regarding biodiversity. According to it, the population of mammals, birds, amphibians, reptiles and fish has decreased by an average of 69% globally compared to the year 1970. Significantly, this conference was to be held under the chairmanship of China in the year 2020 from October 15th to 28th in Kunming City, but due to the COVID pandemic, it couldn't be held in China. After this, it was organized from 7th December to 19th December in Montreal, City of Canada, under the chairmanship of China. Recently, World Bank published a report titled Striving for Clean Air, Air Pollution and Public Health in South Asia. It sheds light on the condition of air pollution in South Asia as a whole. As per the report, currently, over 60% of South Asians are exposed to an average of 35 microgram per meter cube of particulate matter 2.5 annually. This is way higher than the upper limit of 5 microgram per meter cube recommended by the World Health Organization. The situation is even worse in some parts of the Indo-Gangetic Plain, where the particulate matter 2.5 level spikes to as much as 100 microgram per meter cube. The report lays out multiple scenarios and the costs involved in reducing the average South Asian's exposure to PM, that is particulate matter. It states that significant reduction is possible only if South Asian countries implement coordinated policies. It calls for an airshed approach similar to how the problems have been tackled in other regions like ASEAN, Nordic countries and across China. It is worth mentioning that airshed in this context means a geographic area that because of topography, meteorology and or climate is frequently affected by the same air mass and Airshed approach means collectively tackling the issue of air pollution over an airshed by the involved stakeholders rather than acting in silos. To put it into perspective, taking Delhi as an example, even if Delhi were to fully implement all air pollution control measures by 2030, while other parts of South Asia continue to follow current policies, it wouldn't keep pollution exposure below 35 microgram per meter cube. However, if other parts of South Asia also adopted all feasible measures, it would bring pollution below that number. The report states that exposure to such extreme air pollution has wide-ranging impacts. It causes stunting and reduced cognitive development in children. It may also lead to respiratory infections and chronic and debilitating diseases like asthma and heart disease. This drives up healthcare costs, lowers a country's productive capacity and leads to a reduction in total workdays. Recently, a study was published 
in the journal Nature, the study tried to find reasons for the hike in methane emissions in 2020. The hike in emissions in this particular year holds special significance because almost the entire world was in lockdown due to COVID-19. Consequently, it was expected that the overall atmospheric methane growth rate will slow down. However, the exact opposite happened and the methane growth rate in 2020 was highest for the entire observation period of 1984 to 2020. It has to be noted that the systematic record of methane emissions began in 1984 only. The study states that reduction in nitrogen dioxide pollution and increased precipitation in wetlands primarily drove the global methane emissions to record level. Let us tell you that nitrogen oxide can impact methane levels in the troposphere. That is the upper part of the atmosphere. Nitrogen oxide combines with ozone to form hydroxyl radicals. These hydroxyl radicals further react with methane to form water and carbon dioxide. This way, they remove around 85% of methane annually from the atmosphere. Therefore, less nitrogen oxide pollution means fewer hydroxyl radicals and more methane. Similarly, wetlands also impact methane levels. Waterlogged conditions are conducive for soil microorganisms. These microorganisms produce methane. Significantly, 2020 was wetter than usual and precipitation over global wetland saw an increase of 2% to 11%. Therefore, methane emissions from wetlands also increased. It is worth noting that methane has around 80 times more global warming potential than carbon dioxide. Thus, the study will help in finding ways to reduce methane emissions and restrict global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels as was decided in the Paris Agreement. Recently, the government started testing Open Network for Digital Commerce or ONDC. Its purpose is to provide a level playing field to all e-commerce operators. Along with this, it also intends to increase access to the digital market for MSMEs that is micro, small and medium enterprises and small traders in the country. Apart from this, consumers will also be provided with more purchasing options. It will also work to empower them. ONDC has thus been developed as the country's first public digital infrastructure. It is noteworthy that its first office has been set up in Delhi. Actually, it is an open e-commerce protocol established by DPIIT, that is Department for Promotion of Industry and Internal Trade, Ministry of Commerce. It envisages that a buyer registered on a participating e-commerce site such as Amazon can purchase goods from a seller on another participating e-commerce site such as Flipkart. This means that now customers will be able to buy goods from one e-commerce website on another website. In fact, currently for buying and selling customers and sellers are required to be registered on the same app. But now after the arrival of ONDC, this compulsion will end. In this way, it can be called a platform for e-commerce along the lines of UPI. Actually, through UPI, money is sent or received from one payment app to another payment app. Similarly, ONDC will play a role in buying and selling. According to experts, it will work to promote innovation in areas like retail, food and mobility. This will help break the monopoly of the giant platforms to transform businesses. In this way, it will work to empower the suppliers and consumers. It is worth mentioning that on April 29th of this year, the government started the pilot project of ONDC in five cities, Bengaluru, New Delhi, Bhopal, Shillong and Coimbatore. It will be launched nationally by the government in the year 2023. Right now, it has been started only on a trial basis. Recently, Road, Transport and Highways Minister Nitin Gadkari launched the country's first surety bond insurance. This bond will act as a back guarantee arrangement for the infra developers. This will provide protection to both the contractors of the infrastructure project and the awarding institution. This insurance product has been issued by Bajaj Alliance General Insurance. According to Bajaj Alliance, it has been issued considering the demand of the infrastructure industry and the government. Actually, surety bond insurance is a risk transfer tool for the infra authority or company. Through this, the company allotting the project will be assured that if the contractor fails to comply with the terms of the contract, the allotting party will not be at a loss. Unlike bank guarantees, surety bond insurance doesn't require large collateral from the contractor. Due to this, the contractor is exempted from the amount to be deposited in lieu of the project. The amount thus saved can be used by the contractor for the development of the project. 
Also, this product will help in reducing the debt of the contractors to a great extent. This will facilitate the development of upcoming infrastructure projects in the country. Recently, a study was published in the journal Nature Astronomy. In this study, water has been found on two exoplanets, Kepler 138c and Kepler 138d. This has been detected with the help of Hubble and Spitzer Space Telescope. However, researchers are yet to study their nature and size. According to NASA, these exoplanets are located in a planetary system 218 light years away from the Earth. These are related to Lyra constellation. Researchers have compared the size and mass of the planets to that of the Earth. After this, it was concluded that the volume of these planets is three times that of the Earth, and the mass is twice as that. It is also claimed that Kepler 138c and d are made of materials lighter than rock, but heavier than hydrogen or helium. In such a situation, the possibility of the presence of water is expressed in half of these twin planets due to their low density. Scientists have compared them to Enceladus and Europa. Also, the atmospheric temperature of Kepler 138c and d has been said to exceed the boiling point of water significantly. Enceladus is a satellite of the planet Saturn present in our solar system. Similarly, Europa is the fourth largest satellite of Jupiter. A special thing about them is that scientists have expressed the possibility of water being found on them as well. Recently, researchers did whole genome sequencing of banyan and people. The researchers did this genome sequencing using tissue samples from their leaves. Along with this, they have also carried out a genome-wide phylogenetic analysis of four other sequenced ficus species. Actually, this feat has been achieved by the researchers of the Indian Institute of Science, Education and Research, Bhopal. This study has been published in the Clinical Endocrinology and Metabolism Journal. With this experiment, 17 genes of banyan and 19 genes of people have been identified. 15 out of 17 genes in banyan are associated with tolerance to environmental problems such as drought, oxidative stress and pathogens. At the same time, 17 out of 19 genes of people are associated with activities like stress tolerance. The remaining two genes of each banyan and people are associated with developmental processes. These genes have been found to have many characteristics of long-term development in banyan and people. Thus, these genes play an important role in the longevity of ficus species. These genes appeared in these species about 0.8 million years ago. In this regard, researchers say that these genes have been developed by these species in order to fight against natural obstacles. Genes showing developmental traits in banyan are mainly associated with root development, leaf formation, metabolism, pollen tube, seed development and other developmental process, while the genes of people are mainly associated with root development, reproduction and metabolic process. Let us tell you that under genome sequencing, the exact sequence of nucleotides within DNA is detected. Under this, the order of the four elements present in the DNA, that is adenine, guanine, cytosine and thymine is detected with the help of genome sequencing. Various genetic diseases such as Alzheimer, cancer, myotonic diastrophy, etc. can be cured. Along with this, the causes of disease related to human genes can also be detected. Recently, good news came for Kerala. From the point of view of agricultural products, five agricultural products from Kerala got GI tags. These products include Attapadi Attukombu Avara, that is beans, Attapadi Thuvara, red gram, and Ona Tukara Elu. Sesame, besides Kanthalur Vattavada Veluthuli, garlic, and Kodungalur Potuveleri, that is snap melon. These products have been given GI tag, keeping in view the specific agroclimatic condition of the region. The beans grow in the Attapadi region of Palakkad are bent like goat horns. Its stem and fruits are purple in color as compared to other beans. This is due to the presence of high anthocyanin in it. It is helpful for heart disease due to its anti-diabetic properties. Apart from this, there is a high amount of calcium, protein and fiber in it. The high phenolic content present in this bean protects it from various pests and diseases. As a result, this crop is suitable for organic farming. Attapadi thuvara, that is red gram, has a white coat compared to other red grams. Their seeds are bigger and have more weight. Used as a vegetable and pulse, 
This gram is rich in protein, carbohydrates, fiber, calcium and magnesium. Similarly, garlic from Kanthalur, Vattavada region of Idduki has high levels of sulfites, flavonoids and proteins. Apart from this, it is also rich in allicin. As a result, it is more effective in other diseases including microbial infections. Onnatukara ellu, that is sesame and its oil are famous for their unique health benefits. The high antioxidant content present in Onnatukara ellu helps fight free radicals. Being an unsaturated fat, it is extremely beneficial for heart patients. Kondungalur puttuvelari, that is watermelon, is cultivated in Kondungalur and parts of Arnakulam. This snappy watermelon is great for quenching thirst in the summers. Apart from vitamin C, it contains other nutrients like calcium, magnesium, fiber and fat. December 18 was a historic day for the Indian Navy. On this day, P-15B stealth guided missile destroyer INS Mormugao was inducted into the Navy's fleet. Defence Minister Rajnath Singh and many top officials were also present on this occasion. It has been made a part of the Navy at the Naval Dockyard in Mumbai and the warship has been designed by the in-house warship design body of the Indian Navy, while it has been built by Mazagon Dock Shipbuilders Limited Mumbai. The warship has been named after the historical importance of the Marmugao port in Goa. According to experts, INS Marmugao is equipped with modern surveillance radar. Apart from this, it is also equipped with state-of-the-art weapon sensor, surface-to-surface and surface-to-air missiles. The warship is capable of achieving a speed of over 30 knots. Apart from this, it can also be used in situations like nuclear, biological and chemical warfare. Significantly, INS Marmuga was launched in September 2016. Her sea trials commenced on 19th December 2021. This is the same date when Goa was liberated from Portuguese rule in 1961. Let us tell you that four warships were to be built under Project 15B that is Vishakhapatnam class. They are proposed to be named Vishakhapatnam, Marmugao, Imphal and Surat respectively. The first of these destroyers, Vishakhapatnam, has been handed over to the Navy last year. Recently, Social Progress Index was released. It was issued by the Economic Advisory Council to the Prime Minister. The report has been prepared by the Prime Minister's Economic Advisory Council in association with the Institute for Competitiveness and Social Progress Imperative. Its purpose is to promote competition for progress among states. Actually, in this index, the regions of the country are ranked on the basis of their progress. This index is prepared on the basis of three important dimensions and 12 related indicators. These components include basic human needs, the basic of human well-being and opportunities. A total of 707 districts in 36 states and union territories have been covered in the report. This index measures how states fare on nutrition, healthcare, water and sanitation, personal safety and living condition. This index ranks six levels of social progress. Puducherry, Lakshadweep and Goa have been declared as the best performing states in the report. In this, Puducherry got first, Lakshadweep second and Goa got third rank. While Bihar and Jharkhand ranked 35th and 36th respectively are at the bottom of the index. Uttar Pradesh has been ranked 31st in the index. Shimla and Solan in Himachal Pradesh and Aizawal in Mizoram have been placed in the category of three best performing districts. According to the report, Puducherry is the highest scorer in the index. This shows that Puducherry has performed better in elements such as personal freedom and choice, shelter and water and sanitation. Goa ranks highest in terms of water and sanitation and Kerala in terms of nutrition and basic medical care, whereas Mizoram, Himachal Pradesh, Ladakh and Goa are the best performing states in terms of foundation of well-being. Tamil Nadu has the second highest score for the opportunity dimension. Arman and Nicobar Islands have scored the highest for individual rights under the dimension. Sikkim tops the list in terms of inclusiveness. Also, Puducherry has scored the highest in the components of personal freedom and choice and advanced education under the dimension. Let us now look at the five questions based on the bulletin. Questions for this series are first question is recently three Indian sites have been included in the tentative list of the UNESCO heritage sites. These sites include Sun Temple Modhera, Vadnagar City, Gujarat, Unakoti Rock Artifacts or all of the above. Next question is which of the following has launched India's first surety bond insurance product? Sri Ram General Insurance, 
बजाज अलायंस जनरल इंश्योरेंस मिनिस्ट्री ऑफ फाइनेंस और नन ऑफ द अब नेक्स्ट क्वेश्चन इज कंसिडर द फॉलोइंग स्टेटमेंट वन साइंटिस्ट हैव एस्टिमेटेड द प्रेजेंस ऑफ वॉटर ऑन एक्सो प्लैनेट कैप्लर वन थर्टी एट सी एंड कैप्लर वन थर्टी एट डी टू दिस रिसर्च वॉज कैरिड आउट विद द हेल्प ऑफ हबल एंड द रिटायर्ड स्पिटर स्पेस टेलीस्कोप विच ऑफ द अब स्टेटमेंट और स्टेटमेंट इज और आर करेक्ट वन ओनली टू ओनली बोथ वन एंड टू और नन ऑफ द अब नेक्स्ट क्वेश्चन इज रिसेंटली फाइव एग्रीकल्चरल प्रोडक्ट्स हैव बीन अकॉर्डेड जी आई टैग स्टेटस दीज प्रोडक्ट्स इंक्लूड वन अटापडी अटाकोम्बू अवरा टू अटापडी थुवारा थ्री ओनाटोकारा एलू फोर कंथालूर वटावड्डा वेलुथुल्ली फाइव कोडुनगालूर पोटुविलारी विच ऑफ द फॉलोइंग ऑप्शन इज करेक्ट वन एंड टू ओनली टू एंड थ्री ओनली थ्री फोर एंड फाइव ओनली और ऑल ऑफ द अब लास्ट क्वेश्चन इज विच ऑफ द फॉलोइंग ऑर्गेनाइजेशन हैज रिलीज द सोशल प्रोग्रेस इंडेक्स ट्वेंटी ट्वेंटी टू इकोनॉमिक एडवाइजरी काउंसिल टू द प्राइम मिनिस्टर नीति आयोग मिनिस्ट्री ऑफ वुमेन एंड चाइल्ड डेवलपमेंट और नन ऑफ द अब Recently the government presented statistics regarding organ donation. According to this there was a decline in organ donation cases during the first year of the COVID-19 pandemic. However after this the year 2021 has seen an increase in the number of organ donations. According to statistics India is the third largest country in terms of organ transplants in the world. Whereas Spain is number 1. For your information let us tell you that the Transplantation of Human Organs Act of 1994 in India sets various rules regarding the separation and storage of human organs. It controls and regulates the extraction, storage and transplantation of human organs for medical purposes and the prevention of commercial practice in human organs. Recently the Cyberspace Administration of China has come up with new rules regarding deep synthesis technology. The purpose of these rules is to ban deep synthesis technology in China and curb misinformation. For your information let us tell you that deep synthesis technology is defined as the use of technologies including deep learning and augmented reality to generate virtual visuals audios and videos one of its most prominent and dangerous applications is deep fake technology in this cloning of a person's face or voice is done using artificial media thus it is being used nowadays to create fake news and commit financial frauds among other illegal activities Recently the parliament has passed the Energy Conservation Amendment Bill 2022. It allows the use of non-fossil sources of energy and feed stock including green hydrogen, green ammonia, biomass and ethanol. Along with this a provision has been made for the establishment of the carbon market. Through this bill large residential buildings have been brought under the ambit of the energy conservation system. Overall the purpose of this amended bill is to reduce carbon emissions. The Central European Union leaders have approved Bosnia and Herzegovina to be a formal candidate to join the union. Significantly the European Union is a group of countries. It is dedicated to the economic and social development of the European region. It was formed by all the member countries together to formulate and implement the development strategy of Europe. Recent Indian scientist professor Thalapil Pradeep has been awarded the Win Future Award 2022. He has been given this special award as an exceptional researcher or innovator dedicated to innovators from developing countries. Actually professor Pradeep has been awarded by Win Future for the development of a low cost filtration system for the removal of arsenic and other heavy metals from groundwater. Let us tell you that Win Future Foundation is an independent and non-profit foundation in Vietnam. It presents awards to exceptional researchers in several categories every year to honor transformative technological innovations. Recently, researchers have discovered the world's largest DNA in a new study. It has been named eDNA that is environmental DNA 
and it is estimated to be about 2 million years old. This DNA describes a rich plant and animal presence in the Cup Coburn Haven Formation in Piriland, Northern Greenland. Recently, the Sahitya Akadmi Award 2022 has been announced. In this, Badri Narayan will be given the Sahitya Akadmi Award for Hindi. Apart from this, Anuradha Roy for English and Anis Ashwak for Urdu will be given this year's Sahitya Akadmi Award. These awards announced for 23 languages include 7 poetry collections, 6 novels, 2 story collections, 2 literary criticism, 3 plays and 1 autobiography among other works. For your information, let us tell you that the Sahitya Akadmi Award is a literary honor. It is awarded every year by the Sahitya Akadmi to a literary work. These are given in a total of 24 languages including Rajasthani and English language apart from the 22 Indian languages included in the 8th schedule of the Constitution of India. The Sahitya Akadmi Awards were first given in the year 1955. The government of Kerala has published a map of the forest department. This map shows the details of 115 densely populated villages in the state. It displays details of human habitation buildings and farms on the periphery of 22 protected forests spread over these villages. According to the government of Kerala, this map better depicts the block and plot-wise details in these areas, which could potentially come under the 1 km ecologically sensitive buffer zone around the forest suggested by the Supreme Court. According to the government, this map will serve as a benchmark for those who live on the periphery or outer fringes of forest. Recently, a meeting of the Defence Acquisition Council was held under the chairmanship of Union Defence Minister Sri Rajnath Singh. In this meeting, 24 capital acquisition proposals were approved. These proposals include 6 each for the Indian Army and Air Force, 10 for the Indian Navy and 2 for the Indian Coast Guard. The total value of these proposals is said to be Rs 84,328 crore. It is noteworthy that of these proposals, 97.4%, that is 21 proposals worth Rs 82,127 crore have been approved for procurement from indigenous sources. In this way, this indigenous procurement will not only modernize the armed forces, but will also provide a substantial boost to the defense industry. Along with this, it will also help in achieving the goals of Atmanirbhar Bharat. Recently, the High Ambition Coalition for Nature and People, that is HAC, has announced the establishment of a new permanent secretariat. The secretariat will be co-hosted by the World Resources Institute and the Global Environment Facility. For your information, let us tell you that HAC was officially launched in the year 2021 at the One Planet Summit in Paris. This alliance is an intergovernmental group of 116 countries. It is co-chaired by Costa Rica, France and the UK. Significantly, the HSE has set a target of protecting and conserving at least 30% of the world's land and oceans by the year 2030 under the new Secretariat.